The Old Testament reading, I'm right this time. <laughs> the Old Testament reading for this first Sunday after Christmas is from Isaiah chapter 61 and 62. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and your kings, the kings, your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. O Lord, have mercy on us. This was from Galatians chapter 4, where St. Paul wrote, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you were his sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. O Lord, have mercy on us. Yes. Yes. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the, Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 
Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Jerusalem, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, living, having lived with her husband seven years when she, when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything, according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong and filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the
Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The basis for our message this morning are from our reading from Isaiah, from the book of Galatians, and from the Gospel according uh, to St. Luke. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you would turn your bulletin to page 3 and uh, to the epistle of lesson from Galatians chapter 4. Here Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells us, and as us pastors like to say, in a very theological way, what this Christmas was all about. This, this babe born in Bethlehem that we have been celebrating, giving thanks to God for. The theological reason was this. When the fullness of time had come, in other words, when it was time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, for a very specific reason, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive the adoptions of sons and daughters. This babe born in Bethlehem was not there to make us feel good, not there to say, oh, what a joyous time it is and to really justify all the Christmas sales going on. But it was there to redeem us, to save us from our sins. And Jesus did that by fulfilling the law himself. We could never fulfill the law by ourselves. We could never keep it perfectly. Oh, we might physically do all that stuff, but when it comes to our hearts and our minds, we are so far from what God wants us to do. Yet Jesus, in his love for you and for me, came down, born of the Virgin Mary, so that we might be redeemed. Which leads us to our gospel reading, which already Jesus, as a baby, is starting to fulfill what was required in the law of Moses. Now, this part of the church here, we kind of jump around a little bit. This is 40 days after the birth of Jesus. So calendar-wise, this is the beginning of February. And what would happen is that Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus made their way to Jerusalem to the temple for this purification law. Up to this time, Mary was unclean, meaning she was not to participate in any religious activities. In other words, people were not to come visit with her. This is God's, God's way of Jesus had a baby and he's giving her rest from this having a child. So this 40 days later, they made their way to Jerusalem. And Mary had a, a purification process, kind of a baptism. And then they had to redeem this firstborn male. God, all the way back in Exodus, when they came out of Egypt, God says, this is what I want you to do for the firstborn males. They are the Lord's. They are to be dedicated to him. And so he says, you must make a sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice that Moses mentioned first, and way back in Leviticus, about what they were supposed to do, is make a sacrificial lamb. But he made provisions for those who could not afford a lamb. In fact, we see that here. They were to take two turtle doves or two pigeons, and they were to sacrifice them so that this baby could be dedicated to the Lord. So that's exactly what they did. Well, in our story here, we run into a guy named Simeon. Simeon, we have no idea how old he is. Does not mention in the scriptures how old he is. We don't hear of him ever again after this. But Simeon was a devout, righteous, spirit-filled, and spirit-led man. And we are told that he would make his way to the temple, and he was promised by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Messiah, the Savior. I just picture a mind, Simeon, getting up that day, not knowing whether or not he would see it, and he went there, and the Holy Spirit says, there, right there, see that couple, right there, see that baby, that's the one, go up to it, say the words, say the words. And Simeon came up and grabbed that baby, and he blessed God. And he said these wonderful words. We all know them. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. Your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light to reveal you to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. He says these words. And we are told Mary and Joseph are marveling. 
They're astonished at what Simeon just said about this baby. And then Simeon blessed them. And he says, but this child came for a purpose. This child was chosen. In fact, open your bulletins to page four. Go almost all the way, halfway down to verses 33 and following. Simeon blesses them and says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed. This child is the chosen one. This one was the one whom God made promises way back in Genesis chapter 3, that whole crushing head, bruising heel thing. This is the one that has come to save people from their sins. Yet this one was chosen for the fall and rising of many in Israel. There will be many who will accept him as Lord and Savior. But there will be many who will reject. In fact, that he says, and this is a sign that he will be opposed. <coughs> really, maybe a better word that we understand. He's going to be offensive. He's going to say things and do things that will drive people away. They cannot stand what he's going to say. The message, the central message of Jesus is that we are saved by God's grace. There were many who opposed that. That might just shock us. Why would they not believe that? Because they believed that they could save themselves. Jesus came and said, no, no, you can't save yourself. I have come to make do that for you. And that's what Jesus has done for you and for me. And then he goes on to say in verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your own soul as well. What Simeon was talking about was this future event. Mary was going to witness the very crucifixion of her son. Yes, her Savior, but her very son was going to die right in front of her very eyes. Her soul will be pierced. She will struggle with that. But we also know what happened three days later. That this one who suffered and died for you and for me rose again so that we could have salvation. When Simeon says there will be many who will reject, and that happened. In fact, the very reason that Jesus is on the cross is because of those who did reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. And what's amazing still today, that many still reject what Jesus did. They reject the Jesus, not the great teacher, not the miracle worker, but the Jesus who hangs on the cross. Everyone must ask themselves the very question, what does this mean to me? This Jesus hanging on the cross, the one who says, Father, forgive them. The one who says, it is finished. The one who said, I give up my spirit. You have to ask your question, yourself the question, what does this mean to me? Don't reject Jesus. Don't reject him. There are many who reject him. And I will tell you why not to reject him. Because Paul mentions that. He says, Jesus came to redeem us. To purchase us back. To claim us as his very own. Jesus' suffering and death on the cross is our redemption. It's Jesus' way of saying, you are mine and that will never change. So the question is this, what do we do when we say that Jesus is our Lord and Savior? What does our lives look like? Well, we see that in the second person that showed up on that day when Jesus and Mary and uh, Joseph showed up at the temple is this woman named Anna. We're told a little bit more about her than Simeon. She was 84 years old. She was a daughter of Samuel of the tribe of Asher. Asher was one of the northern kingdoms that was carried off into captivity. But some way, somehow, her family was preserved. And she came to the temple every day, fasting and thanking God. And that day, she saw her Savior. Her Lord and Savior came that day. And she said to everyone, look, see, 
Give thanks to God, our salvation has come. It reminds me of the shepherds. Remember in that first Christmas Eve when the angels came and said, Go to, to Bethlehem, for the Savior is born. Find that big rack and swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. And they, we are told they quickly went and they told everybody what they had seen and what they had heard. That's what happens when the Lord comes to us. It changes our hearts and our minds. That we want to tell others of what Christ has done for you and for me. In fact, turn to the Old Testament reading on page 3, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah writes these words, he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of righteousness, he has covered me with the robe of salvation. I switch those. When you become a child of God through the waters of holy baptism, God places upon you his robe of righteousness. That he looks at you as his dear child. That he no longer just sees you alone, but he sees Jesus with you, in you. And you have been declared righteous. You have been redeemed. Now, how did you hear about that? I will make a bet, not that I bet, but I will make a bet, that somewhere along the way, someone of an older generation shared that, that with you, whether it was your parents or your grandparents, someone whom God sent into your life to share with you this great good news of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. We've been doing that here for over 160 years here at Emmanuel, from one generation to the next. And we see that happening in our gospel reading. You have Jesus, the earliest generation, his parents, and then we have the older generation. As they went around and shared the good news of God's salvation with those they came in contact with. As God's people, God wants us to share what he has done in our lives with others, so that they too can hear the good news of God's salvation. From one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. I mentioned that one of our saints, Eleanor Gerbers, is went to be with the Lord. She often reminds me of Anna. Now she would go, I was much older than Anna. She was 99 years old. She would go, Anna, a mere child. But when she was well, she was here. She would come to church. She was often involved in the life of our congregation, sharing the good news of God's salvation. In my mind, I just picture her and Anna having a wonderful conversation right now. Talking about how they gave thanks and they told others about Jesus. That's my prayer for you. That you do that as well. From one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Thanks be to God for this wonderful gift that he's given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.